Global India Network. Print, TV, events, podcasts. Find out more at globalindianseries.com. Welcome back to your Global Indian Podcast, home to the greatest conversations and the official platform for open and liberal minds. Because yes, let's face it, we are everywhere. Now you know, every single week we plunge ourselves into the human experience behind our perceptions of identity, take a second look at the countries we now call home, and tackle those big conversations. Well, this week, there is one thing that has predominated the news platforms right the way across the Commonwealth. and It is the unfortunate demise of the Queen of England. Now, regardless of where you are on the spectrum of thought, or whether you are a royalist or non or anti-establishment, there is a deeper personality at play here. And that's the question about the unity that brought together the Commonwealth. You know, something that brings together... 2 billion people, these humans on the back of this blue rock. Well, if you look at the news headlines trending in countries such as Barbados, into St. Vincent, the Grenadines, Australia, and even remnants here, a lot of people are reconsidering their relationship with the royal family. And the questions at stake for the next king, well, the king of England right now, King Charles, is saying, well, what can you do? to repair, to rebuild, and to re-establish a new notion of a united Commonwealth. Now, to help answer these questions, I'm joined by our very own ambassador for Commonwealth Affairs. He is a former actor. He was a director of the Commonwealth Business Council. Of course, is Dr. Mohan Call. He's met the Queen over 50 occasions, has worked hand-in-hand with the royal family, and has been a key spokesperson for the Commonwealth for over three decades so who better to guide me through these perplexities of questions at a time where Commonwealth identity is at stake? As always, I'd like to say a massive thank you to all our dear supporters and sponsors, many of which are here from now. And if you too would like to be part of our 50 Shades of Brown discussions, well, it couldn't be easier. Simply come to the website, which is globalindianseries.com. There you can see this podcast's entire repertoire of discussions so far. I truly hope you enjoy this remarkable discussion as a deep dive into something that is of modern day history. Now for a quick note from my dear sponsors. Hi, this is Dharmesh Shingala, co-founder of Novus. At Novus, we believe technology leads the way for a meaningful change. We are on a mission to change the way corporations, governments and institutions interact with information. Same as the Global Indian Podcast, help people transform for a better future. Find out more on how we are inspiring global change either at the Global Indian Series website or Novus website to learn more about our innovative software solutions. From our family to yours, I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nesto Alfred, CEO of St. Lucia Citizenship by Investment. Think freedom. What comes to mind? Freedom to explore, to travel to any destination for work or play. Or is it freedom of expression? Being surrounded by the globally minded, those who care for society and environment. Every year, people from around the world apply for St. Lucian citizenship because they realize that real freedom is based on choice. Discover more about St. Lucian citizenship and how it's helping global Indians achieve more. My name is Chitra Stern and I am a proud global Indian ambassador and CEO of Martignal Resorts and Martignal Residences. We pride ourselves on the journeys that define a community and our developments bring people together. Did you know that over 70,000 people just like us call Portugal home? The Global Indian Journey has brought people together in a meaningful way. And on behalf of all of us at Martignal, we want to thank you for joining us in these remarkable conversations. We look forward to seeing you here in Lisbon post COVID. Hi, my name is Divya and I'm co-founder of the Global Indian Podcast. Before you get to today's show, I've got a quick favour to ask. If you've been enjoying our conversations, I'd love if you could take just one minute to leave us a review on the platform that you're listening to us on and share our work to friends and family. It helps us out a lot. Word of mouth is the primary way that we grow. Thanks for your continued support. We joined the conversation with me asking Mohan, well, what's it like to be you at this moment in time after serving over three decades plus 
working alongside the Commonwealth and the royal family. Some of us who have been uh, involved with the Commonwealth, either as officials uh, in the Secretariat, Business Council, other organizations, as well as heads of government and officials of Commonwealth countries, we never realized that one day uh, Commonwealth will be without the Queen, in the sense Queen was an, uh, as a very part of the Commonwealth or the center of the Commonwealth or without, uh, because she has, uh, I have worked in Commonwealth as you know, maybe over 30 years, but she was there from the initial conception of Commonwealth when her, her father, uh, when India got the independence, that is the time the modern Commonwealth sort of took shape. And uh, so as a result, uh, she had developed such a relationship with the Commonwealth that we, um, she was part of it. I mean, when you, uh, uh, you know, many of us who have met, you know, I've met her, I don't know, 40, 50 times during my time. And uh, she was such a perceptive person. I think Commonwealth was in her top agenda, along with, of course, the Britain um, uh, and the United Kingdom. Uh, so uh, uh, for Commonwealth, uh, generally the population or the people who have worked uh, with the Commonwealth or with the uh, governments, uh, this is a sad moment, it is a personally sad moment. And so um, uh, uh, she kind of personified um, uh, the uh, equality in diversity because she was there uh, everywhere. So I think, uh, well, I mean, as, as she would have liked Commonwealth uh, to remain uh, uh, as a uh, 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 as a significant body in the um, world. Uh, and I think that will continue. And the new um, King Charles will, will certainly continue the work of, uh, uh, of the Queen, both uh, in, in, in the country here and as well as in the country. Because you, you've met with, at the time, Prince Charles, now King Charles, on a number of occasions as well. So how does he view the Commonwealth? What does it mean to him? I think uh, he, uh, basically he, for example, he attended many, many uh, functions, what we organized. And uh, he always uh, took an interest in basically uh, how, how the Commonwealth as a, as a group of countries with a similar past, um, how do they play a role? I think he, he uh, 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 like his mother, he wouldn't get involved in too much in the actual policy making and, uh, and actual running of the Commonwealth. But he would make his mark by addressing the situations like the climate change, like, um, uh, like trade, uh, and investment, uh, like good governance, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, respecting the diversity. So uh, I think these were the issues also very close to her, his mother. And, uh, and he had, uh, he has, I think, uh, every um, desire to carry forward uh, the, uh, the work of the Commonwealth in the same way as a mother dad. So it's, it's really peculiar times because when you go on other than newspapers, depending what you're reading, or if you're on social media, there seems to be a very clear cut of opinion. Some people are saying, well, now is this the demise of the Commonwealth? Does it start to go downhill? You got a large number of com countries either that's saying, look, we'd rather become Republicans. Um, on the other side, you got people saying, well, actually, maybe this is a time that we strengthen our relations with each other and we go beyond just the royal family because it can't just be about the colonial past. 
it's either way is a tricky situation to be in. Why do you think the Commonwealth is going to be heading into? Because again, you've had over three decades of experience working there. You worked with all the heads of state. You're our ambassador for Commonwealth Affairs for the Global Indian. You, you are in the know. From your previous exposed experience to where things are heading to, what's the next step? Let's see what is, uh, you know, you've got to understand, I think some people don't uh, 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 put the Commonwealth in the context. There are two kinds of countries who are in the Commonwealth. One is the Commonwealth countries where the queen was the sovereign head at the head of the state and the King Charles will be the head of the state. That's like New Zealand, Australia, yeah. Canada, um, St. Vincent, uh, Jamaica, Grandins. a yeah. number of about 14 countries. So it's a 14, 15 countries where head of the state, that's like, uh, is the queen, is, was the queen and is the King Charles. So that is one kind of commonwealth. Those countries, might, might, some of them, might, would, might uh, create, uh, might think that this is a time when we should uh, be a republic. But you might have heard Australian uh, Prime Minister, who is very much for the republic, uh, 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 for Australia, has said that he is not going to, at least in his first term, is not going to talk about that. I doubt many of the countries, uh, I doubt uh, Canada or others will change the head of the state. So, but there are these 14 countries, 14, which the King Charles is now the, the sovereign head, it's titular head, but it is like president of India. Um, the King Charles is the same route for Canada, for Australia. Some of these countries might think this is the time to, uh, to have a local head. I think last year, if you remember Barbados, yeah. uh, said that they will have a local head of the state, uh, like having a president or whatever. A president. So that may happen, but that will not change the Commonwealth structure. So when people are talking about Commonwealth, they confuse the two things. Mm. One is where King Charles is the head of the state or sovereign head. Others are Commonwealth countries, they are all countries are part of the association of Commonwealth, which is uh, uh, an association which doesn't have, which has a tutorial head in terms of King Charles now, but they're not subjects of the uh, King Charles. They're not, uh, he, he's not a head of uh, those countries. He's a tutorial head representing the Commonwealth because we have same values, similar uh, diversity. We accept certain ways. Uh, we, we represent the Commonwealth, people of Commonwealth. But that is a kind of uh, a respected role, but it is not an uh, administrative but, role. But it should be almost like a democracy, shouldn't it, the Commonwealth? So then is there an argument being made that they're saying, well, no longer should the head of the Commonwealth position should be a member of the royal family? It should almost be... Those questions over. will certainly come up, yes. Yeah. There, and now, would... Um, is there an advantage or a disadvantage in that? We don't know. Uh, because the, com the head of the Commonwealth does not play, does uh, not play any administrative or any policy role. It's only kind of, um, uh, it's only keeping Ceremonial. the countries together as a tutorial head. And uh, Queen did it so well because so she attended the heads of government. But she did not. Uh, she did not take part in the deliberations of the discussion that was there. But she would come uh, in the last few um, shogams she inaugurated. But she wouldn't. Uh, earlier she didn't. 
Um, she would meet all of us who were working around. She would meet each and every head of the state. And uh, every head of the state uh, was very keen to meet the queen. It helped the small nations. Understand, there are small nations whose population is you know, less than 10,000 or 20,000. And they feel such a part of this organization, they feel a link with a, a sovereign head of a, a country. And that gives them a lot of, lot of confidence and uh, remaining in the head. So you can see different reasons why uh, uh, head of the Commonwealth is uh, the king or the queen before it. See, the, and I suppose there lies the deeper questions about the future of the Commonwealth, because if it's to create its own identity that's identifiable outside of just the perplexities of royalty of the UK, therefore the whole notion of who heads it up, even if it's a ceremonial position, almost needs to update itself as well. Now, when you hear these murmurings right the way across, and you're right, not every Commonwealth country was part of the former colonial role. If you look at countries like Rwanda, for example, they joined in fairly recently. you got other countries that are looking to come back in. And some countries were kicked out and then re-registered. Nigeria is being a classic example of that. Now, the question goes in, this is a community of 2 billion plus um, and it's got these loose affiliations. We've got the same languages, same law, same structures to, in order to do business. Under the Queen's rule and reign, the Commonwealth did make strides. It tackled some of the bigger issues. But do you feel that it was utilized as much as it could have been? And what do you think would change? Say, for example, if King Charles does become the leader of the Commonwealth and everybody's united in that. What changes would you like to see in there to make sure that the structure works stronger than before? See, uh, that's a good question. What do, what do countries uh, expect yeah. for, from an organization of which they are a member? You've got to understand. When, uh, when we were part of, the, part of the Commonwealth, when I was there, in the first 30 years, or the first uh, 30 years, 25 years, or still 1995, till uh, Nelson Mandela attended the uh, meeting of um, heads of government in, I think, New Zealand it was. Till then, all of us had a purpose because when I joined Commonwealth, 30 of the countries were still either military dictatorship, yeah. because that is military dictatorship had taken over from, you know, after the independence, or, you know, they did not have a, 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 a government which was elected with election. So our aim in the Commonwealth Secretary at that time was to really help create the structures of democracy. And that is what we were doing. So, and there was a mission, there was a thing, and there was no other mission than the Commonwealth sector than to get everybody. And the second related mission was that once countries are having uh, a government which is uh, elected by the people, the second one was how to keep that government uh, kind of successful. So we worked on uh, public service, strengthening public service structures, strengthening in investment. And that is where um, we got this, uh, you know, we did business council. That was the idea when uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair came in. So we, we sort of then to, to survive the country's needed structures Great, of private yeah. sector investment. That's what we did. I think that part is almost and now done because most countries now have their own structures, their structures. Also those days, uh, UK government and others used to um, uh, provide much more financial support because all this needed financial support. How do you get financial support? So some of these activities 
uh, were also the ones which I was involved were also supported by UN and all that. So one is the organization will, will survive only on two things. One, it has a good program, which is a program of activities, which is very relevant to the countries it is serving. Secondly, it has the necessary finance uh, to be able to support those activities. Yeah. In both of these things is now, there's a challenge. The challenge is basically, I think that since the international financial situation, the UN itself is not getting the similar kind of financial commitment as was before. Commonwealth Secretary is also not getting a similar financial because there's such so, a mem because member countries have to pay a fee, don't they? They they yeah, can't have to pay a fee, and you know, but member countries have to pay. But most of the big countries or richer countries support the activities, support yeah. the, uh, like Britain, Canada, because Australia, it, it essentially is an it was an extension of economic and public diplomacy between each other. This was these loose affiliations that started to strengthen up over time to say. Let's look beyond our borders and see what more we can do with each other. So now we're at this unprecedented time where we have things such as Brexit is taking place. We're looking towards all these emerging markets. These emerging markets are looking towards us. The, the central figure that connected us was the queen at that moment in time. And now you've got very unsettled waters because nobody knows what takes place next. So I suppose the other part of this, Mohan, that you're mentioning is that the willingness of those countries to see the Commonwealth as a viable opportunity for them. And therefore saying, what are my needs as a country at this moment in time? Do I want to do further trade with the UK? And has this organization helped facilitate that? Because if it does that, then surely they're just going to move elsewhere. I mean, trade uh, uh, with UK and other countries is certainly an important part of this. But uh, there are other ways of doing it. Mm. There are uh, a Commonwealth has certainly helped, but it is not the only organization which has helped because of the creating of regional organization. Yeah. There are regional bodies now. There is a Pan-Africa thing. Yeah. There. So there are many other regional bodies and Commonwealth has never been able to uh, create a free trade agreement between the countries. And that's because the countries are in a much different uh, uh, administrative, economic, and, uh, you know, status. So as a result, it's very unlikely that there will be a Commonwealth free trade agreement, very unlikely. And yeah. that's what we tried many, many, many times. It didn't. But what is most uh, successful is the help which is which the smaller countries. So there are 15 countries in the uh, very small islands. Yeah, the, the Vanuatis and the Tiruatis, so yep. They feel, you know, they get lost in the United Nations and they get an uh, uh, they get an opportunity to meet the heads of government of very powerful countries in Commonwealth for three days, sitting shoulder to shoulder to each other. They get a ma majority help because they, uh, this is an important association for small countries, very absolutely, because they otherwise wouldn't get that much of um, uh, help. The second, uh, so that is uh, certainly they, it is certainly helping them. And it's certainly helping to earlier democracy uh, and investment was a major uh, theme. Now climate change is a major theme. So the climate change does is an important th uh, theme where Commonwealth could play a role. So I think Commonwealth can make a distinct uh, change or um, influence on a particular issue, as, as earlier democracy is, if you talk to anyone, I think we played a major role in 
strengthening the democracy in the Congo country. And so the climate change is one thing which we can make. Secondly, I think Commonwealth is one thing, which is where the queen uh, comes in, was uh, it's an equality in diversity. So uh, it's a real experiment that we have diversity uh, of nations, of populations, but we have equality in terms of their status sitting around the table. And also if Commonwealth has to take a different kind of areas which will unite them. Uh, so climate change probably is one. Equality and diversity is one because, um, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, uh, World uh, um, Economic Forum uh, prepares an annual or biannual report on gender equality in yeah. the world. And I was very surprised and actually ple pleasantly surprised then in the first 10 countries, two of the Commonwealth countries were there and they were not developed countries, they were African countries, Rwanda and Namibia. In Rwanda and Namibia, or I think the sixth and the eighth countries in the world, while women have the same status than men, I mean, they come in the first yeah. 10 countries. Britain is very much lower. Uh, yeah, U.S. is very much lower. Canada is very much Finland is there in the Europe. Uh, and so uh, there are, uh, there are um, uh, um, countries in the Europe, but Scandinavian countries. But Britain is very much, U.S. is very much now. So I think that is where, so when I look at that, I said, oh my. So here are two Commonwealth countries. We have the first ten, Rwanda. And maybe we should learn. That is yeah. what we should learn from them. So that's why we need to identify the strengths of the countries and then use it in our, I, in our, I'm not in favor. I mean, what happens that I'm not in favor of uh, um, um, uh, um, expanding uh, the Commonwealth uh, in non uh, country, uh, non um, uh, uh, English speaking countries and all. That was the strength of Commonwealth. We had no yeah. translations. We uh, when Rwanda became a member, Rwanda they was took a, a concerted country because they did, took a concerted effort to change from a French speaking a country effort. to everybody yeah. in Rwanda from a small school child to the president speaks both languages as fluently as anyone else. Yeah. So they introduced English immediately in two years time. Uh, everybody was speaking in schools and so they did that, but other countries are not, ex I, I had a lot of discussions with some other countries earlier, Gabon and others. It was very difficult for them to change the language. If you're not doing that, you don't necessarily get the same kind of and it's, uh, and it and it showcases so why well. expand Commonwealth beyond mm -hmm. that that is why UN is there other regional is there Commonwealth was a unique it just happened that we are all uh, all Commonwealth countries were British uh, colonies but it's it, it changed the color uh, in the sense that that was the start. But that, not the end. Yeah. It well, will, well that, that leads me on. Is the, the Commonwealth meant something to the Queen? Does the Queen mean anything to the Commonwealth after her passing? Is it the case that the legacy ends now and the new chapters begin? I think uh, what you really said, uh, for, we should use the passing of Queen as, as an integrating factor in the Commonwealth. Yeah. So what I thought, which is why we have discussed before, we should have a Commonwealth Museum or something because it is in the Queen. All of the Commonwealth countries, Queen was almost the first uh, head of the state, every yeah. head. Uh, and earlier, some countries had uh, her father uh, when they got the independence, but the, she was the one of this 
what is called the modern commonwealth. And in that modern commonwealth, modern commonwealth is very different now. As I was talking, I, when I joined commonwealth, the Uganda was a very poor country. And uh, you had to uh, go to Uganda to, to, to have a dollar currency. It was a, such a, such a uh, you know, big uh, problem in look, looking at how it is. Today, Uganda is one of the most successful countries in Africa. Uganda has produced scientists, technology guys who are, uh, you know, who are, you know, spearheading uh, um, solutions for malaria for others. So I feel, uh, like I said, Namibia is ahead in the women area. So there are a lot of things Commonwealth countries have achieved last seventy years. Uh, uh, and those achievements should be shown because then only common, con, uh, because as of now, people different. If you go to the, if you go to the uh, uh, outside in the road and ask people what is Commonwealth, some people think Commonwealth is, you know, still uh, a British empire. Yeah. Others feel something. So, but we should, if we had a museum, and the best, you know, I, I don't know if how much you have been, but Marlborough ha Marble House was... Oh, it's, uh, it's a perfect location for something like that. The Queen gave it to the Commonwealth. You know, it's a, it's a present from the sovereign, from the Queen. Yeah. So it is, it belongs to Commonwealth Secretary as a gift of the Queen. Yeah. So uh, uh, it is difficult. Uh, you need money to keep it going. To, uh, to manage but, it. But I, but think, I think what you're saying there, though, Mohan, it makes sense. You're saying the Commonwealth has changed its shades over the many years, the many decades that have gone past. And whereas most people, the common person, has this perception of the Commonwealth, which is this is Britain still owning, taking ownership of things. It is no longer that. But the best way to demonstrate that is through a museum, because a museum showcases the artifacts, not just as a gesture saying these are the countries, but it clearly and precisely indicates this is the changes that took place, how these countries start to formulate themselves, how they created their own identities outside of Britain, importantly, and also the value chain that they created in the world in terms of global peace, in terms of global prosperity, in terms of people to people relations. And, yeah, and now you have this home, which the Commonwealth Secretariat sits in, which is a lot of questions surrounding that. But surely at a time where everybody needs to collectively grieve, but more importantly, they all collectively need to see the future. Surely this should be the beacon of place where the world can come together. They can still host their events, but more important, they can look back and say, here's a record of achievement, what we've done collectively together in the name of 2 billion people. Well, two billion lives literally have been changed because these are the formulations in place. This is why we should be proud. Now, that for me sounds like a great idea, Mohan. I know that you've been saying that. I think constantly. this is the time to uh, take it forward, to use this opportunity to take uh, forward the Commonwealth structure positively, not negatively. It's not, uh, it will not go away, uh, but um, strengthen the Commonwealth further rather than weaken it. Because it, it, repair, it repairs, but it also rebuilds the perception between countries, but also between the people of those countries. Because I know in Uganda, you walk around the streets in Kampala and you speak about the Commonwealth. The average person has no idea what it means. Likewise, in India, in Pakistan, <laughs> through to Nepal, I'm sure in Vanuatu. And that's the thing. If we are going to say it touches the lives of 2 billion people, well, I think those 2 billion people better know what lives are being touched. And that's why you have this. So part of your museum, would you be looking to do an online platform with that as well? Or is it purely physical? What would be the no, idea? No, no, I think on, I mean, uh, it would be always to have a physical as well as online. Uh, I think um, uh, if you look at um, London Science Museum, it has a, something like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we should uh, look at, I think also countries have to commit uh, resources to the Commonwealth as a new era 
to go forward. Uh, because if the organizations, if the developed countries do not commit resources, Commonwealth Secretariat may remain there, it might do, mm. but it will not play a significant role. Uh, so, but it can look at the strengths of the Commonwealth and commit resources. I'll tell you what my biggest fear is with the Commonwealth, Mohan. I know that we've had this conversation a few times. It's, I believe that there is something special with the Commonwealth. It has the opportunity to develop not just nations, but a collective consciousness towards the big issues that we all face when it comes to corruption, when it comes to things like climate change, when it comes to inequality. But where we are now with the Commonwealth Secretariat, which is a beacon at this moment in time, we're seeing that a lot of people are looking at it as a symbolic gesture rather than something that can be actively utilized to tackle the globe's problems. And I know that you said that you had the modern Commonwealth that the Queen came into. She took it on. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next because the, literally the next year or so is going to dictate whether the Commonwealth has changed shades, whether it is moving forward progressively, bringing people together into the fold, making sure that it's active, efficient, and therefore value for money for those countries that put money in, or whether it would just be almost an elephant in the room. It's almost the best diplomacy of the dead is tradition. And so therefore it remains that traditional alliance. And that's the biggest fear that I have because every country that you've been to and subsequently underneath your wings that I've also been able to travel to, you start to see there are these amazing opportunities, but they're not being taken care of. They're not being taken shape of. And if we don't do it together, well, as you rightly said, there's going to be more regional organizations that come in that will continue to erode away the relevance of the Commonwealth. And therefore, unfortunately, the legacy of what's it once held. Um, I know that you share those frustrations, probably not as, as direct as me, but when you were there and you look back at those years and you obviously got amazing memories of the Queen and you got amazing memories as well as a good relationship with King Charles, you know, in the next 10, 15 years, even further, the next 40 years, what do you hope to see? What is your wish from that organization? I mean, the uh, main uh, thing, you see, if you look at, uh, um, if you, um, King Charles is, is a very much climate change ambassador yeah. for Britain, as well as for other countries. I, flee, I, I believe we should use that because his interest, his influence on the world stage, on the influence of uh, uh, even uh, the donors. I think climate change should be the main thing for the uh, co Commonwealth, particularly, as I told you, about 20 countries of the Commonwealth are small islands and they will not survive no. uh, this climate change. So the climate change to me is, uh, I tell you that I thought as you were talking, reflecting, that when Queen King became, she was such a uh, human person and she yeah. was such a touch on the Commonwealth, the democracy, achieving democracy was a natural fit Evolution, absolutely. As a, that was the natural, that was people where it was democracy. And I always, as a person, related her to this every time. As I said, I joined in 1980s uh, and there were 30 countries still not democracies. Yeah. And then in 20 years of time, or 20, uh, 10, uh, less than uh, that, we, the Commonwealth sector really helped to change the uh, those that was the actually power, and that was the smiling queen in the uh, influencing behind the scene to the heads of the state to accept the democracy. Was that I feel the King Charles will be two things. I feel the Commonwealth can be the beacon of um, one is the climate change, other is the diversity, equality in diversity. If you see the uh, cabinet of um, United Kingdom now, it's very different than what was there 10 years ago. Yeah. So we represent the cabinet of the 
United Kingdom represents all the populations in the United Kingdom. So I feel UK has shown that you know it is it is also a beacon uh, uh, of the change, and therefore Commonwealth countries can play uh, that role of equality. And so, as I said, Namibia, other countries. So equality in diversity and yeah. climate change is my feeling of a, a natural uh, kind of progression from democracy and investment. And, and I think that's the thing is also being able to demonstrate what the Commonwealth has achieved, what it means to people and how it has impacted people's lives without the PR, without the propaganda. And that's why what you're saying yeah. in terms of having a museum, it becomes a uniting point and more in grand for these open conversations to say, actually, this is not about the wealthy or the common people. This is about the commonality of humanity of collectively under 2 billion people. These are the themes that we've all gone through is the transitional moments in our lives to say, this is what equality now means to us. It's not about a royal family anymore. It's not about London being the center of power or the Commonwealth Secretariat, it's a whoever wins takes all type of mentality. But it's more so saying, actually, as common people with a common purpose on this planet, these are the struggles, these are the challenges. But more importantly, this is what we've been able to achieve. And I think that would be such a wonderful idea. And you see, there is no Commonwealth without Great Britain. Hmm. I don't, so tomorrow, Great Britain says, I'm going to leave Commonwealth. There will be no Commonwealth. Do, so do you therefore, think that's interesting. Do you feel that the Commonwealth could not survive without Great Britain? Because if surely... It I, be I don't enough. think it will survive. It's a, it's a glue. It has no... Uh, people don't understand. It is not a colonial structure. It started with a colonial structure. Yeah. It, but I don't think the structure as it is... Uh, now, as, as an association, the, the, of the purpose, nations, the purpose as, has changed, hasn't it? Huh? The purpose of the Commonwealth changed. At the beginning, it was colonial. Now it's saying, actually, it's about well, we don't have rule over you. You don't have rule oh. over us. So how, how but do it will not together? survive without without the participation of Britain. That's really you can't interesting. Just change Commonwealth and take it to some other country, and then. Think okay, Commonwealth without Britain. Well, what, what if last. what if the Secretariat were to be picked up every four years, for example? And I mean, it will become there is not you know the organization survive if there is a purpose, if there is a they make some change, or there is funding for that. If uh, Take the tomorrow the Commonwealth, but who will find that? Well, well I, I think I think the, the controversial thing that I'm going to say is I think the funding's there is whether the willingness within the Commonwealth Secretariat is there to upload, to change, and to challenge. That question, I don't know who can answer that. So that's going to be left with them. Well, I will leave it but to that. So my my I mean, but as of as of now, I feel one should build the strengths of the strength that we have. We have a strength yeah. of King Charles, who is a great ambassador of climate change. Why not to use him to our kind of use to, uh, to strengthen the Commonwealth, say, in climate change? No, fantastic. Uh, so that is my feeling that we should look at the strengths. There's no... There is no need to change the Commonwealth Secretary to a different place or different. Those are not necessarily those. We uh, those are not. It well, doesn't affect us. Here's another question, Mohan. It's um, I love these talks because they're always open. It's exactly how we speak normally. It's you got this conversation about reparations going on in the Caribbean, and you got murmurings now from even the likes of places in India, Pakistan, and I think that in those areas more symbolism. How do you think those conversations impact the idea of the Commonwealth about these collective communities of people who are fighting for equality? Because surely that is an elephant in the room when people look to it. Yeah, but this. you have to, the main problem as of now is you, you're not, there's a distinguishing 
factor between Britain uh, as a United Kingdom, their policies and that, and Commonwealth sector. Some of people get confused. Yeah. When we are talking about, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, how the Republic, citizens yeah. earlier uh, uh, were treated or whatever, the money needed, that's a, that's a United Kingdom uh, thing. That, that's, that's not a Commonwealth issue. But, is, but the two things are being pushed That's together. why the, it's the, it is confused. But Commonwealth sector has absolutely nothing to do nothing with Nothing over that. That's and Commonwealth has, has nothing to do with that. I mean, it's a, it's a bilateral thing between the, because it was a united. So you can use Commonwealth uh, mechanism to influence the decision, but it is not directly involved in any, any way in the That is my feeling. Other than general policy, that uh, so uh, I suppose it's just people it's, shaking it's, off the colonial shackles of ideas, but the problem is, I guess, it's that's why you're saying the museum so important because it clearly demonstrates that this is what the Commonwealth is, this is what its actual impact is, and everything else that people kind of associate well, that's not to do with this collection, that may be between a state as well as another state, but is not to do with this community right here which is why it's important. Mohan, thank you very much for your time this morning. It's been well, an you. absolute pleasure, like it always is to meet with you. And, thank um, you very much. What a fantastic conversation. Now, I'm sure that this is going to be the first of many more discussions, having a look at the ideas revolving around the common wealth. And I use that intentionally, because some people say, well, the common wealth only offers two perspectives, those of those who are the common people of those countries, which many of the two billion population under that belt belong to, and those who represent the wealthy of those nations. Again, it's almost as bipolar states. But others, the Commonwealth could represent so much more. It could represent the first notion in our collective human history of us coming together in a powerful display to say, not only is diversity our strength, but we the people will unite in the global challenges, fighting, for example, of the issues surrounding climate change. Also having a real look at inequality. But in order to make the Commonwealth something that is perceptible for the common people, well, there's going to have to be great changes in place. I'm going to leave it for there for now, but I hope you join me for next week as we continue our voyages around the world. It'll be our normal show that we plunge into the human identities of our ideas of nationalism to really look at the nations that we call home, but also tackling those big conversations. Until then, I hope all remains well. Take care for now. Global Indian Network. Print, TV, events, podcasts. Find out more at globalindianseries.com.